This video was brought to you by Ren. More on them later on in the video. An adult engaged in writing a book for children may well intend to present a life-affirming vision that communicates cultural values and traditions. But at the same time, that adult may consciously or unconsciously induce, even seduce, the child to accept and repeat the neurotic discontents of culture and civilization. What if I told you that the beloved children's fiction character Willy Wonka was evil? And I don't mean secretly a serial killer kind of evil, I'm talking about an evil that is much more insidious, much more mundane. I want to tell you the story of Willy Wonka. You may think you know his story, you may think that you know all about this eccentric genius, this beloved chocolatier and confectionery mad scientist. This man's story has been told in a book, a sequel to that book, a single chapter from a secret unwritten third book, a film that was nothing like the book, a film that was a lot more like the book, an upcoming film on Wonka's backstory, not one, but two upcoming animated Netflix series, two video games, three stage productions, and at least one theme park ride. But until you take all of these adaptations, dip them in a dream, and look at them for what they are, look at them for what they're really telling us, you don't really know the story. Each of these adaptations, as different as they may be, come together to form a mosaic that, from a distance, shows us the real story of Willy Wonka. Allow me to tell you four stories. Four stories that represent four sides of a many-sided man. The Willy Wonka. Shall we? But first, I want to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, Wren, a public benefit company committed to tackling the climate crisis head-on. When people like Mr. Scrum Diddly Smokestacks over here use their undue influence to pollute our planet, it can feel like there's not much we can do. But that's where Wren comes in. Wren is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint, figure out some ways that you can reduce that footprint, and then offset it by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects like tree planting and mineral weathering and rainforest protection. But climate change is a huge system-level issue, and while individual actions can help, we also need systemic changes to actually curb the climate crisis. And Wren knows that, which is why they have partnered with two climate policy groups that aim to track legislation and promote policies and advocate for new green technologies and improve the transparency and integrity of climate change solutions. My favorite of these projects is their support for the Clean Air Task Force, which is an advocacy group that helps to promote system-level changes, and they have a 25-year track record of being consistently rated as one of the best organizations fighting climate change. And with Wren, you can not only support this incredible organization, but any of their other awesome projects that promote conservation efforts and green technology innovations. One of their other project focuses is tree planting, and the first 100 people to sign up to Wren using my link will get 10 extra trees planted in their name. Wren is doing real good in the world, and their business model is equitable and transparent. So when you sign up and start making contributions to projects, you know exactly where your money is going. Whether you just want to take that first step and focus on your personal choices, or if you want to make impactful structural changes through political action, Wren has you covered. So if this sounds up your alley, then click the link at the top of the description or in the pinned comment to get your 10 extra trees planted in your name. And thanks again to Ren for sponsoring this video. Now back to Wonka. Let me tell you the story of Willy Wonka, the Chocolatier. From his humble background as the son of a dentist, Wonka grew up with a love for inventing that was surpassed only by his love for chocolate. He had a face that was alight with fun and laughter, and was quick and sharp and full of life. In short, he was an extraordinary little man. And extraordinary is right. Wonka had decades of wild success as a candy man. He made magical candy, like ice cream that never melts and bubble gum that can be blown up to huge sizes, in the largest factory known to man, and he shipped his goods all over the world. 
But all was not well in Wonka land, because even though he kept his recipes under wraps, his competitors somehow got their grubby hands on his secrets and started making their own unmeltable ice cream and bubblegum that can be blown up to immense sizes. And because Wonka was, above all, a capitalist, he simply did not suffer industrial espionage. So Wonka made the difficult decision to lay off all of his workers and close the factory to quell the flood of secrets coming out of his business. The factory remained closed for years. And then one day, the chocolate started flowing again. Out of nowhere. No one was rehired, and the factory was still closed to the public, but trucks came and went, and the world-famous chocolate bars were back in stores. Wonka's candy was loved by all, but the secrets of his factory remained a mystery. How did he continue making chocolates even though, as they say, no one ever goes in, and no one ever comes out? Unbeknownst to the people of the world, Wonka had hired thousands of Oompa Loompas to work in his factory. He had saved them from the dangers of their native home country, Loompa Land, and brought them back to his factory where he paid them in cocoa beans, a food that was not just delicious, but was precious to the Oompa Loompas. Around this time, Wonka began to feel tired. He was getting older, and he knew he wouldn't be able to keep making chocolate forever, but alas, he had no children or other heirs to whom he could leave his business, the factory and the Oompa Loompas. He needed to find someone he could trust, someone he knew was worthy of the candy empire he had built. But who? And how? One day, Wonka announced out of the blue that he was starting a contest. He would be hiding five golden tickets in his Wonka bars, and whoever found the tickets would be welcomed into his factory for a tour and a chance to win a lifetime supply of Wonka chocolate. The world went wild. People bought out all the bars and developed underground black markets for chocolate. Wonka mania had taken over. The first four tickets went to Augustus Gloop, a boy from Germany who loved food, Veruca Salt, a wealthy heir to a nut fortune, Violet Beauregard, an American girl who was a gum-chewing athlete and veritable pop star, and Mike TV, who loved television and, according to some sources, may have actually cheated his way into his golden ticket by hacking Wonka's system. The fifth and final ticket went to Charlie Bucket, a young boy who was the only child of an impoverished family who lived right down the street from the Wonka factory. His grandpa Joe actually worked at the factory while it was open and was part of the wave of workers who were fired. But even still, the whole family loved Willy Wonka, and Charlie loved him most of all. And because of Wonka's contest, he got to meet his hero. On the day of the tour, the children and their guardians went to the factory, and Wonka greeted them warmly. But not all of the children were kind and respectful like Charlie was. Augustus, Violet, and Veruca were all greedy, and Mike was ungrateful and disrespectful. In fact, the children were so bad that they actually injured themselves in the factory because they didn't respect Wonka's rules. Augustus greedily drank from the chocolate river and then fell in and was almost turned into fudge. Violet selfishly grabbed a stick of magic chewing gum, which then turned her into a human-sized blueberry. Veruca demanded that her father buy one of Mr. Wonka's animals, either a trained nut-cracking squirrel or a golden egg-laying goose, and when she didn't get what she wanted, she fell down into the garbage chute. And Mike arrogantly took control of the Wonka vision machine, an invention that could send chocolate by television, and was shrunk down to the size of a doll. But Charlie Bucket didn't do any of those things. By the end of the tour, Charlie, the poor boy from just down the road, the boy who spent the last of his money on a Wonka bar, the boy who revered Mr. Wonka and just wanted to meet his hero, had won. And Charlie didn't just win a lifetime supply of chocolate, but he also became Wonka's heir and will inherit the factory once Wonka retires. His family came to live with him in the factory, and they even went on an adventure with Wonka in his great glass elevator. And they lived, as they say happily ever after. Let me tell you the story of Willy Wonka the Candy Tycoon. But Zoe, I hear you say, we know the story of Willy Wonka the Chocolate Tycoon. Isn't that just the story? Dear listener, while it may seem like the story of Wonka the Candyman is the story of Wonka the Tycoon, it is not. You don't know the story of Willy Wonka the Chocolate Tycoon, because this confectioner, this industrial icon, is not just some wealthy business owner. He is not your average capitalist. He is, somehow, much worse. From his bourgeois upbringing as the son of a white-collar professional, Wonka grew up with a love for money that was surpassed only by his love for chocolate. 
He had a gold-topped walking cane and a wardrobe that screamed old money. And money he certainly had. Wonka had grown up to become an industrialist. He started his company, he hired thousands of employees, he brought relative prosperity to the town where his factory was located. The factory chimneys belched out beautiful white smoke, the delicious breath of industry making its mark on the sky. He was a success. But then, the leaks began. Wonka was the victim of industrial espionage. His beloved candy secrets, the magical recipes that had netted him his fortune, were escaping the factory. Someone was stealing the recipes and giving them to his competitors, and Wonka did not abide by theft. Where weaker men would have rooted out the problem and only fired the individual culprits, Wonka knew that men were selfish, and he would never truly be rid of spies as long as he employed common folk. So he did the only reasonable thing. He fired the entire workforce. With all of the bad workers out of the way, he needed some new, good workers. Workers who wouldn't question him, who wouldn't steal his secrets and give them to his competitors. So, like any good capitalist, he turned to the best and cheapest solution for labor. Slavery. The Oompa Loompas were a race of African pygmies. Well, Wonka said that they were African pygmies, but then when he was told that that was racist, he changed his story and said that instead they were just some non-human people who came from Loompa land. In any case, the Oompa Loompas were a tiny people from a secluded jungle that was rife with monstrous creatures. And because Wonka is such a strong, brave, pragmatic man, he saved the poor Oompa Loompas from their plight and made a deal with them. A great deal. The best deal. A very artful deal. He would pay them in cocoa beans, a product that he had already sourced and had regular shipments of, and in turn, they would run the factory and he wouldn't have to worry about paying actual wages to actual workers. So the Oompa Loompas agreed and followed him back to his factory. Or as he put it, he imported them because as we all know, workers are products to be imported and not actual people. Anyway, the town surrounding his factory had fallen into ruin because the thousands of employees that he'd had were now unemployed and none of the money that Wonka made was funneled back into the town's economy through people's wages. But Wonka didn't care about that. He wasn't in the business of charity. He was in the business of chocolate, and business was booming. Where weaker men would have lowered their products' prices to compensate for having fewer overhead costs, Wonka did the only sensible thing. He kept his prices as high as ever. Only deserving children would be able to consume his magical products. In fact, rather than lower the price of his chocolate bars, he developed an entirely new candy specifically for poor children. He made this, the Everlasting Gobstopper, a candy you can suck on forever and it'll never get any smaller. Why make your candy accessible to everyone when you can just make different candies for different markets and purposefully exclude some groups from being able to buy your other candies? That makes them exclusive and exciting, and it makes people want them. While his Gobstopper was everlasting, Wonka himself was not. And though he'd lived to a ripe old age, he knew that immortality technology was still a ways off, so he needed to find an heir. Wonka knew that his heir needed to be a child because a grown-up wouldn't listen, he wouldn't learn. He would try to do things his own way and not Wonka's. And that is when he conceived of the Golden Ticket Contest. This contest was a huge success in terms of the business. Wonka mania took hold and sales were up by orders of magnitude. He was making money hand over fist. In fact, people were eating so much of his chocolate that they were getting more cavities than ever, which led to increased profits for the toothpaste factory in his town. And these increased profits also meant that the factory could automate its processes and the owners laid off a pretty good portion of the workers. But again, that wasn't Wonka's problem. He was making more money than he could spend in a hundred lifetimes. What did he care? Now, in terms of finding a proper heir, the contest's success rate was pretty poor. The first four children were bad. Augustus and Violet were greedy. Now, as a capitalist, Wonka knew that greed was good, but as a businessman, he knew that conspicuous consumption wasn't necessarily what he wanted out of an heir. These two children were the wrong kind of consumer. They had consumed correctly enough outside the factory. They had paid for the candy fair and square. That was their right as customers. But inside the factory, now they were grabbing and eating and consuming things that didn't belong to them. 
They hadn't paid for the ingredients or products Wonka had. It was his. They stole from him, and for that, they were punished. Veruca and Mike were bad for different reasons. These two had tried to take over the means of producing candy. They tried to take his geese and his squirrels and his revolutionary new technology. They tried to take what was rightfully Wonka's. He was the candy man, not them. It was not theirs to take, and for that, they were punished. But Charlie Bucket, Charlie Bucket was a good boy, and even better, he was a good consumer. Charlie hadn't gotten his ticket from his birthday candy bar that he always shared with his grandparents, or from the candy bar he bought with the money his grandfather had so kindly lent him. No, he got his ticket from the candy bar he bought immediately after buying a bar all for himself and himself only. A good consumer, indeed. In fact, when Charlie told his mother he'd found the ticket, his mother told him his father would have been so proud of him. Proud of his son for buying a Wonka bar. Proud of him for being a consumer who did what he was told and didn't make a fuss about being poor and put what little money he had back into the well-oiled machine that is the economy. And even on the tour, Charlie was quiet and didn't step out of line. He did as Wonka told him, didn't complain, played the game the way it was supposed to be played. Charlie was perfect. And because he was perfect, he won. He got to be the protege of Wonka and live the rest of his days in luxury. What happened to the other children? They were punished for their transgressions, of course. Severely punished. Because Wonka's factory is nothing if not a meritocracy. Those who deserve good things get good things. And those who deserve bad things get bad things. And those children got bad things. And thus, the circle began again, with yet another young boy being raised in the upper echelons of society, being primed for his role as a bourgeois businessman whose sole goal in life is upward expansion and endless growth. He cut his teeth on profit margins and fudge, continued paying his workers in cocoa bean scrip, and the greedy, undeserving children grew up to be greedy, undeserving adults, living greedy, undeserving lives. In other words, Things were as they are meant to be, with the power in the hands of those who deserved it, and they lived happily ever after. Well, Charlie did, anyway. Let me tell you the story of Willy Wonka, the trickster. From his draconian childhood as the son of a strict, unloving father, Wonka grew up with a knack for lying that was surpassed only by his knack for candy-making. He was a clever man who had a small, neat, pointed black beard, and his eyes, his eyes were most marvelously bright. Now, I know what you're thinking. But Zoe, we know all about the dark side of Wonka. We know that he's not actually the hero of the story. We know that the factory is unsafe, and we know how, if you look closely, as the group travels through the factory, the number of seats on their transportation goes down, like Wonka knew that the kids were going to die, and some people even speculate he's a serial killer who was knowingly luring all of those kids to their deaths. Well, dear listener, first of all, it's rude to interrupt. Second of all, that is a story about Mr. Wonka, but that is not the story that we are going to be telling today. See, the unsafe nature of the factory isn't subtext, it's just text. The factory is unsafe and the children are injured or worse. But that doesn't mean that Willy Wonka is a serial killer or that he was secretly planning on killing anyone when he sent out the tickets. Now, to be fair, according to some sources, Wonka does just actually straight up murder those kids, but I am getting ahead of myself. All of this is to say that while you may have heard some stories about a dark and dangerous version of Wonka, those have no bearing here. We are not going to talk about how he's secretly a serial killer or how Charlie Bucket actually grows up to be Wilfred from Snowpiercer, a theory that somehow is incredibly popular even though it holds about as much water as 80-year-old tissue paper in a drought. No, this is a story about Willy Wonka, the trickster. And as a trickster, Wonka wasn't dark and scary. Not on the surface, at least. If you can hear that helicopter. <sighs> Hopefully you can. See, even before the Golden Ticket Contest, the people absolutely loved Wonka. He was a great industrialist, a clever man, a hero to children and adults alike. 
The people loved him so much that his competitors took notice and tried to steal his recipes. Wonka may have been beloved, but he was not good. When Wonka shut down his factory to stop the leaks, the town around him fell into ruin. And yet he still thrived because he knew that the world was addicted to his chocolate. He knew that the greed of men would keep his business afloat. While Charlie Bucket's family was suffering under the poverty that Wonka himself had created, Wonka was off in Africa using his finely honed powers of manipulation, a skill he had learned during his childhood of hiding candy from his father, to convince an entire population of indigenous people to leave their home and follow Wonka back to his. When Wonka began the Golden Ticket Contest, people only loved him more. Like the proverbial Pied Piper, Wonka used the powerful seduction of not just chocolate, but a lifetime supply of chocolate, more chocolate than any human being could ever hope to eat, to lure children deep into his underworld, his underground factory made of imagination and childhood wishes. It wasn't just children who were caught in his spell, either. Even when they knew that it was a marketing stunt, and the Golden Ticket Contest was a marketing stunt, he was keenly aware of what he was doing being the master manipulator that he was. Even when they knew it was a marketing stunt, Charlie Bucket's grandparents called Wonka brilliant and a magician. When the time came around for his Golden Ticket tour, Wonka took advantage of this adoration and introduced himself with a lie. He pretended to be an infirm old man when he was really a spry, cunning, energetic, old man. He came onto the scene with a song that could only be described as villain-esque, and then led his unsuspecting wards into a labyrinthine prison of his own design. Like a fey creature stealing your name, Wonka convinced his guests to sign a contract that they had neither the time nor ability to read. And once they had signed away their souls, that was when the mask began to slip. That is when the clever magician faded away and the unfeeling trickster appeared, when the people's adoration turned to fear. At every opportunity during the tour, Wonka goaded not just the parents, but the children, too. He interrupted them, he talked circles around them, he gaslit them about their own knowledge and experience. Wumpa land, there's no such place. Excuse me, Mr. Late. Wonka, I am a teacher of geography. Oh, well, then you know all about it. And what a terrible country it is. Mr. Wonka, I teach high school geography, and I'm here to tell well, you... Well, then you'll know all about it and know what a terrible country it is. And even when the children began to step out of line or bend the boundaries of the rules, Wonka didn't stop them. He barely feigned concern. Don't just stand there, do something! Help. Police. Murder. Look at me, I'm gonna be the first person in the world to be sent by television! Hey, get away from that thing! Stop, don't, come back. And you might well think that Wonka hated these children. But he didn't. No, he felt something much worse. Indifference. To Wonka, these children were playthings. They were pawns to be tortured and toyed with until they were worn down into nothing. Even the children's punishments weren't given by Wonka himself. No, he had designed this factory specifically so each child would bring their punishments onto themselves. Their hubris would be their undoing. And that's when his victims realized who or what he was. Appalled parents looked on as their children were maimed or killed. Children are literally torn apart or explode, leaving entrails on their parents, and Wonka responds with jokes and banter. Mike TV asked Wonka to continue the tour with a line, Can't you just kill another kid so we can get to the prizes? Charlie and Grandpa Joe, away from the group, pondered whether Wonka had actually caused harm to come to these children, and they concluded that Mr. Wonka wouldn't do that, and as long as we do what Mr. Wonka says, I'm sure it'll be alright. Right? It wasn't until Wonka's ire was focused on them directly that they turned on him. When Charlie and Grandpa Joe were the last contestants at the factory, Wonka discovered that they had stolen his fizzy lifting drink while on the tour, and refused to give them the grand prize. Grandpa Joe became furious, called Wonka a cheat and a swindler who had built up a little boy's dreams and then smashed them to pieces. He was an inhuman monster. But Charlie, being the naive child that he was, gave the trickster a peace offering. And that changed his mind. 
Once Wonka turned on the charm and gave Charlie the prize, the tides changed and the buckets forgave him. He was back to being a hero. When Wonka and the whole Bucket Clan went on a trip in his Great Glass Elevator after the events of the Golden Ticket Tour, they got first-hand experience with this trickster, and it was only then that the rest of the family became fully aware of how manipulative he was. And this constant back and forth, this will they, won't they, this is he evil, did he actually do that? No, he's a candy man, a candy man wouldn't do that. This gaslighting and cruelty and manipulation, that is the spirit of Willy Wonka. Now we're on the final leg of the journey, and I just want to warn you now, if you're faint of heart, turn back. Because after this, your life may never be the same. Let me tell you the story of Willy Wonka, the god. But Zoe, I hear you say, what the f I know, I know. I said that I wasn't going to humor those dark fan theories about how Wonka is secretly a serial killer or cannibal, and I'm not, because those theories are built on nothing but vibes and our current culture's obsession with dark and gritty interpretations of kids' media. This is not. From his training as the child of a Wonka had a love for creating that was surpassed only by his love. He was an old man, but you wouldn't know it by looking at him. He looked spry and energetic, but was old. Very old. No one really knows how old. No one remembered a time before Wonka. He and his chocolate had just always been there. His factory, too. Wonka had built the factory to be the largest in the world, and while that was years ago, somehow no one had yet built one that was bigger. His factory was a land of pure imagination, a paradise, heaven, even. See, long ago, some of his workers turned against him, and he cast them out, instead populating his paradise with creatures known as Oompa Loompas. This chorus of cherubim ran the factory and followed orders from Wonka, keeping the chocolate flowing even when the doors were closed to outsiders. Skeptics saw the factory producing chocolate without the old workers, and they came up with theories. Some thought he was a necromancer, using dark magic to revive the dead as his workers. Clearly, Wonka's reputation preceded him. People knew he was powerful. They knew that he had no qualms with the dark arts, and they weren't entirely wrong. Wonka built his factory to be a paradise, but it's not the kind of paradise you may be thinking of. See, Wonka created his factory to be a place of indulgence, a place of consumption and feasting, but also a place of punishment. It was a garden of perfection, as long as you followed the rules. It was bright and colorful and cheerful, but all those colors hid the darkness that lay under the surface. Eventually, Wonka decided to grant entrance into his factory to a select few, those who could prove their worthiness by finding his golden tickets. And because it was a candy factory, he placed the tickets in candy bars. Candy is most loved by children, and children, you see, are trusting. They have faith. And Wonka fed on faith. The factory, he said, must be believed to be seen. In order to enter his kingdom, you had to believe. But not all children were good. In fact, four of the five recipients of the golden tickets were bad little children. Augustus was gluttony personified, who ate Wonka's magical chocolate without really understanding its quality. Veruca was a spoiled Russian ballerina whose father bought her everything she wanted, so she valued nothing. Violet was a self-centered pop star, and her father wanted her to be famous more than anything. And Mike TV was actually a juvenile delinquent who had not only hacked his way into getting his ticket, but he was actively a worldly sinner, hoping to receive redemption, the ultimate prize in paradise. Suffice it to say, they were all spoiled and greedy in one way or another. But then there was Charlie. Charlie, the chosen boy, the pious poor, the true believer. He loved Wonka, wanted to grow up to be just like him, wrote him letters and sang to him every night before bed like a nightly prayer. Once a year, the Bucket family held their traditional Wonka bar ritual. On his birthday, Charlie and his family gathered, formed a circle around the communion steward, and it began the rite of the Whipple Scrumptious Fudge Mallow Delight. 
the slow, almost sensual unfurling of the silver wrapper. The anticipation that makes your mouth water as you think of that bar that snaps in your hand, leaving just a touch of melted sweetness on your thumb. And when you place the succulent square between your lips, the rich velvet softens against your tongue, then presses against the roof of your mouth before slowly sliding down your throat, leaving you warm and happy, but never satisfied. But that year, Charlie didn't find his ticket in his birthday bar. Truly, he would never find his ticket in chocolate he shared with his family. Because, you see, Wonka devised his ticket contest so that only greed could truly grant you entrance into his kingdom. It was only when Charlie bought chocolate all for himself that he passed the test. After nearly giving up hope of finding a ticket, Charlie was walking along the street when divine intervention caused him to look down and spot money, money in the snow, enough money for a week's worth of food or more. But Charlie, in a brief flash of selfishness, decided to spend it on chocolate. And that was when he found his ticket. All he needed to get into Wonka's paradise was a little bit of good old-fashioned greed. And that was it. He was in. Charlie used the power of his golden ticket to resurrect his grandfather, the bedridden 96-year-old Joe Bucket, and together they went to the factory for the tour, along with the other five children and their guardians. Wonka introduced himself with a lie and a hymn about faith, an ominous song about seeing and believing, and in they went. The first room that they entered was the Garden of Eating, the land where everything was edible, and the children were given free reign to eat anything they could get their hands on. Anything except one thing. They were forbidden from touching the literal lifeblood of the factory, the Chocolate River. Augustus Gloop, the boy whose greed manifested as gluttony, made the mistake of eating, or more accurately drinking, the forbidden product. And he fell in. As quickly as his greed had granted him entrance into paradise, it also produced his exit. And like the cherubim who appear at the threshold of the Garden of Eden to signal and ensure Adam and Eve's exit from it in Genesis 3, the Oompa Loompas appeared whenever a child's transgressions got him or her ejected from the factory. And so they sang of Augustus. They sang of his faults. They sang of his sins. And away he went. Down the tube. Down. 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 Never to be seen again. The fall of Augustus began the long, slow, painful process of punishing the remaining children. Next was Violet, who, like Augustus, had tainted the body and blood of Wonka's factory. By greedily grabbing the gum, she defiled the Eucharist and was, like Augustus, punished, sung out by the Oompa Loompas, and never seen again. Veruca and Mike didn't commit sacrilege like their counterparts. Instead, they blasphemed. Rather than stealing the edible ends of Wonka's production, they attempt to obtain the control of the means of his production, a nut-sorting squirrel and a teleporting television camera, and thus continue the escalation from disobeying God for selfish pleasure to actually attempting to become like God. Both of those children, like the other two, ended up away. They were punished, serenaded by the Oompa Loompas, and never seen again. These four children, gluttonous Augustus, greedy Veruca, prideful Violet, and wrathful Mike, represented all that was evil with the world. They represented the dirty, mortal existence that had caused Wonka to close his factory to the world, and they were punished accordingly. When those four awful, bad little children were gone, only Charlie was left. Charlie proved himself to be a good, pious child, and he was granted entrance into the upper floors, where the other children were sent down deeper into the earth, even to a fiery incinerator. Charlie was given access to the great glass elevator and sent up and out. Wonka brought Charlie to the room full of everything he'd ever wanted at the tip top of the factory and gave him unfettered access to everything, a permanent residence in paradise, and like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, 
Charlie was also given dominion over the Oompa Loompas. Even the tempter figure, the serpent Slugworth, wanted to have the secret of Wonka's everlasting creation and tempted the children to work for him. But in the end, just like the Christian devil who ultimately serves God's purposes, Slugworth is revealed to have been working for Wonka the whole time. But what does it mean? What are the actual tenets of this faith? Wonka asked the children to be greedy enough to find the tickets, but not so greedy as to take what belonged to him. He wanted followers who quietly took what they were given, whatever they were given, cherished it, but didn't ask for more. Wonka, this chocolate god, wants children because they are faithful and don't question him. He wants perfect faith and obedience. He wants followers who will treat his chocolate with the reverence it deserves. Followers who will perform the rituals and consume and buy and eat, and when they don't have enough to eat, they won't complain. They won't ever ask for more. He invites people, flawed people, yes, but still people, into his paradise and then punishes them when they make mistakes. He meets out justice, whatever his perverse meaning of justice is, unilaterally and without mercy. He is not God, not in the Christian sense anyway, and his heaven is not heaven. He's not a benevolent God. He is something else, something worse. As ape of God, Wonka ever expands his universal kingdom, undermining the solid earth and providing not daily bread, but daily sweets, only for those who can buy them. Tunneling into the bowels of the earth, Wonka fills them with chocolate-producing machinery that will bring him the lucre with which to enlarge his realm. Wonka is a god. He's not a benevolent god. Not a god of goodness and light or a messiah here to forgive your sins. He's a dark god. Darker than the purest cocoa and just as bitter. He's a god of industry and money. He's a god of all the dark, dank places deep below the earth. He's a god of mischief and gluttony, a god of feast and famine, a god of starvation and desire, of sugar and the screams of children. He is the undying hunger, the vast, unknowable phantom of fudge. Blessed is he from whom all blessings flow, blessings both rich and bitter, both sweet and sour, both bite-sized and everlasting. Blessed is he, Willy Wonka, son of Wilbur Wonka, slayer of Wang Doodles, captor of Oompa Loompas, prince of dark chocolate. Praise be to him. Amen. An adult engaged in writing a book for children may well intend to present a life-affirming vision that communicates cultural values and traditions. But at the same time, that adult may consciously or unconsciously induce, even seduce, the child to accept and repeat the neurotic discontents of culture and civilization. I opened the video with this quote because this video wasn't supposed to be like this. In all honesty, I started writing this video with the simple goal of just talking about why Willy Wonka isn't actually a good billionaire. It was going to be the first in a series of videos about wealthy characters and kids' stories and analyzing whether they're good or bad. But as I got farther and farther into the source material, the Broadway musical especially, I realized that, for this story at least, the question wasn't as simple as, is Wonka good or bad? Because Wonka isn't just good or bad, he's enigmatic and complicated and multifaceted and weird. I even considered ignoring that source material and just pretending that the movie or the book were the only things that existed. Because that'd be fun, right? I mean, people on the internet love silly little analyses of kids' media, so I should just talk about how Wonka had slaves and killed kids, so he's bad, actually. Hashtag cancelled. The woke mob comes for Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka and the... cancellation factory. That's... okay. <laughs> well, obviously, I didn't make that video, so I don't think that's true. I made this video because I think that we have a lot to learn from kids' media. 
because as Basmashian says, even if writers try to teach good lessons with their books, all art is a product of its time and it's inescapable. There is nothing you can do about it. Culture and society and unconscious biases leak in always. But the good news is that that means that we can use art as a mirror, and that's what I want to do with this video. What is it that the character of Willy Wonka and the story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory say about us? What does it say about us that we feel this gross satisfaction whenever bratty, spoiled kids get what's coming to them? What does it say about us that no one questions Wonka's importation of the Oompa Loompas? And when we hear Veruca demand that her father buys her one, we just think, wow, she's such a brat, and not, wow, that is literal slavery. What does it say about our culture that we equate consuming with morality? What does it say that Charlie is a perfect consumer, that it's not heroics that win him his prize, but his poverty and his piety, the fact that he's starving but never asks for more? that makes him good enough to enter the kingdom of chocolate at the right hand of the Wonka. We live in a world where Charlie Bucket lived within sight of a chocolate-producing factory and could only afford to eat chocolate once a year. He was starving. In the books, he literally had to ration his energy so he wouldn't pass out during school. And he lived just down the street from a factory that produced a luxury food item. We don't question it. As readers, we don't blame Wonka. But I want to ask, is there anyone else to blame? This story reflects our rampant consumerism and the commodification of everything. In Wonka's factory, everything, even the literal grass and rocks, become not food, but candy. No longer is the earth a bread basket that provides us with nutrients. Instead, it has become a land of sugar highs and the inevitable crashes. It provides us with empty calories, leaving us with brittle bones and a gnawing hunger for something real. But all we get is a facsimile, the suggestion of something real. And this is true of the actual real-life Wonka candy, too. I mean, we're shown this incredible candy in the movies, these beautiful chocolate bars with whimsical names, this magical everlasting Cobstopper, but they're all fake. They don't exist. Even, like, my everlasting Cobstopper, like, I 3D printed this and then, and then painted it. It's fake. It's not real. I'm not going to bite it because I'm afraid. <laughs> a couple of the less popular ones were around for a few years, but now the Wonka brand has been sold off so many times that most of the candy just doesn't exist outside of Jawbreakers and Laffy Taffy, two candies that, let's be honest, aren't super great. At least not compared to the literal magic candy from the movies that these two real candies come from. And that's to say nothing of the commodification of the Wonka story itself. We have a story about consuming that has itself become an object of consumption. The original book has spawned sequels and film adaptations and musicals and video games and Netflix shows and a prequel and theme park rides. Just like a potato chip brand that periodically comes out with cool new flavors that you just have to try, more and more so does our art. As Charlie and the Chocolate Factory enters the 21st century, its identity as a family of diverse, mass-marketed products rather than as a single text attests to the effects of commodification on its messages about consumption. The consumption of food dramatized in Dahl's text is swallowed by the proliferating activity of consuming the products associated with it. Increasingly, reading the book or even just watching the original film adaptation is just one event in an interrelated group of events which become self-referential, pointing not to a cultural and religious identity outside of themselves, but to the very act of ingesting media as a perpetually satisfying endeavor. So it's like, you know, we've had the MCU, we've had the DCU, now get ready for the woo, the Willy Wonka extended universe. God, we live in the bad timeline. <laughs> This sucks. <sighs> Woo. It's funny because it's bad. <laughs> We're being primed for consuming. We're being taught that being a consumer is something worth being proud of. Charlie gets the golden ticket like it's an accomplishment of something great instead of just being luck. Luck that, like his grandfather says, isn't really equal. You have as much chance as anybody does. Boulder does. The kids are going to find the golden tickets are the ones who can afford to buy candy bars every day. Our Charlie gets only one a year. He doesn't have a chance. If you can buy chances of winning, 
then those with more money get more chances. And yet Charlie's consumption is seen as good, because he was a quiet, docile consumer who did what he was told and didn't make a fuss about being poor. Because he spent the last of his money on candy, he won. As they say, gotta spend money to make money. The story also highlights just how much we hate what we see as greed, gluttony, unfairness, or unjustified success. When people think about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the first thing they think of is, what the f happens to those kids? And while, yeah, it is a little extreme, remember children literally explode and get ripped apart in the Broadway version, it's worth thinking about why that is such an important part of the book and films. In every adaptation, not only are whole scenes dedicated to the children's mistakes and subsequent punishments, but we also get Oompa Loompa songs that punctuate every single child maiming. So why do we hate these kids? Why do our heroes' family members, characters we're sympathetic toward, immediately after being introduced to the four bad children, decide they are simply terrible and unworthy? Told you it'd be a poker. What a repulsive boy. She's even worse than the fat boy. What a beastly girl. Despicable. Well, it's a good thing you're going to a chocolate factory, you ungrateful little bu- for one, I mean, we have the absolute fat phobia exhibited toward Augustus Gloop by literally everyone in every adaptation. We see this fat child and immediately assume that he's gluttonous and morally inferior. He can't restrain himself from eating, so he deserves our derision. We also have children getting things that we've decided they don't deserve. Augustus is fat, so he must not need any more food. Veruca is rich, so she doesn't need free candy. Violet, so full of herself, she only wants the gum because she wants to be the first person to eat it, not because she actually cares. Same with Mike. I mean, he doesn't care about candy. He just cares about the next interesting thing. Because they get things they don't need or deserve, they get punished. And we love to see them punished, even if it really was the parents' fault for raising their kids like that and not the fault of the kids themselves. We love when people get their just desserts especially when the punishment fits the crimes. And that is what makes Wonka's punishments so deliciously sweet. Well, I mean that and the, and the sugar. <laughs> this is also related to why we root for Charlie. He's poor, so he needs things, and he's kind, so he deserves to get those things. It's the mythical good poor person who doesn't spend their money on frivolous things like ponies or avocado toast, remember he only gets one chocolate bar a year, combined with the myth of meritocracy. Good people get good things. If bad people get good things, then it puts the whole system on its head. We can't have that. Good people get good things, and Charlie Bucket is a good person. We want to see Charlie rewarded for his virtue, his goodness. The golden ticket offers him this reward. Charlie has a chance to receive happiness in proportion to his virtue. Charlie incites in us our demand that the good be rewarded and given what they deserve, and the wicked punished. Charlie makes us want to demand justice, and Wonka provides it. The story provides a glimpse into that world where we may hope for justice, where we're allowed to believe the lie that it will be all right in the end. But let us dare to ask, what is justice worth? when those children are seen as wicked. What makes them wicked? That they're flawed? That they happen to be born to parents who raised them with certain less than stellar values? That they were raised in a society that values consumerism and consumption, and they, a bunch of children, I remind you, internalized it? These children are spoiled and irritating and grating beyond belief. But does that mean that they're worthy of our hatred? If being fat, or wanting stuff, or being proud of yourself, or spending too much time on your phone or in front of the TV condemns you to death, let he who is without sin throw that first stone. Whether those children are genuinely bad or not, Charlie is still unequivocally good. But what actually makes him good? Like really? What makes him worthy of being our protagonist? And what does it say about us that we see him as the story's hero? In the story, Charlie's goodness comes from sitting down and shutting up. He's a quiet boy from a poor family with no real notable qualities. 
The 2005 film even opens with a line about how he's not smarter or faster or more clever than the other children, his family was not rich or powerful or well-connected, and most importantly, he doesn't speak up or speak out. He doesn't complain about literally starving to death. And above all, he reveres Wonka. He thinks Wonka can do no wrong. Charlie Bucket is a blank slate. And that is, of course, exactly what Wonka wants. Charlie Bucket is the quintessence of the deprived empty ego, and therefore a colorless, docile hero, an uninteresting simpleton, a Charlie who will not threaten Wonka's egocentric trickster self. Wonka wants an heir who is willing to listen and learn without having opinions of his own. Charlie's ego is a bucket willing to receive. But to the reader, why is Charlie a hero? Why do we care so much about this kid? We're used to our stories following a hero's journey, where the protagonist faces challenges and has to change or grow to overcome them. But Charlie encounters no obstacles and needs no heroics. For poverty, egolessness, and passivity are his virtues. In other words, Charlie's lack of qualities, his lack of money, his lack of tenacity, his lack of an opinion, his lack of anything that would make him stand out, is what makes him a hero. Our society values people who fit in. We value sitting down and shutting up, doing what you're told, falling in line, keeping on that grind. What we don't want is people who buck the system. The system is there for a reason. We need to maintain the system. If you go against the grain, if you don't fit beauty standards, if you get something that you don't deserve, if you have too much of an ego and think you don't have to follow the rules of the system, if your interests fall outside what's normal, you're deviant. Each of the naughty children is eliminated based on his or her individual quirks. But Charlie's comparative lack of vitality and uniqueness is what makes Charlie the perfect candidate to take over Wonka's factory. Charlie's lack of individuality is what allows him to slip into the background, join Wonka in his observation and judgment of the other children's failures, and then emerge triumphantly as the winner. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is not a rebellious celebration of childhood quirkiness, but a moralistic celebration and preservation of societal order. Childish rebelliousness is ultimately quashed by a Foucauldian system of discipline and punishment. Charlie's only good trait is that he has no traits at all. We want him to win unimaginable riches because he didn't complain about being poor. We don't want people who complain or want things to change. We want people who love the system even as it kills them. Speaking of systems that kill people, Willy Wonka's story also highlights just how invisible colonialism is to a lot of us. Wonka is a literal white savior. A wealthy white guy goes to the jungle looking for exotic plants and saves a bunch of indigenous people from the dangers of their homeland, the place that they've presumably been living for thousands of years, and then brings them back to his factory where they conveniently can never leave and puts them to work doing sometimes really dangerous work for literally no money. The Oompa Loompas are slaves. And what's worse, they're slaves who, we're told, actually love doing the work. They're happy here, we swear. They sing and they dance all the time. And yeah, we don't pay them, but we give them food and a place to live. It's disgusting. And no one questions it. Say what you will about the 2005 adaptation, but it did do a good job of highlighting, purposefully or not, some of these issues. Burton makes explicit the story's colonial undertones and encourages the audience to consider the alienation of the modern industrial worker. Burton's Oompa Loompas share a single brown face, capturing both the interchangeability of workers and the suppression of individual identity demanded by efficient production. But Wonka is a hero. He's a man who we're taught not to question. So we don't question this either. But even if we didn't know to question it in this story, we can question it in the real world, because this kind of thing still happens today. Some chocolate today, in 2022, is being harvested using slave labor. 
Now, I'm not going to name any names because I really don't want to get in trouble for libel or defamation, but I have links in the description to the Slave Free Chocolate website if you want to learn more about that because it is still happening and it is an issue. All of this is to say, the myth of the candy man who uses slave labor to make candy for a bunch of white kids, it's not a myth. It's much more real than we would like to admit. But now that we know about it, now that it has been illuminated for us, we can start to do something about it. A lot of these problems are pretty big. <laughs> there are systemic issues that are hard to fix, especially as individuals. And even Charlie, the fancy new face of Wonka Chocolate, doesn't have the power to fix things. Because while Wonka is to blame for a lot of the events in the story, the problem that he represents isn't an individual problem, it's a systemic one. You may say, well, Wonka's not in charge anymore. He gave the factory to Charlie. Charlie is a sweet boy. He'll be better. No. <laughs> the problem is systemic. Regardless of who's in charge or how benevolent they might be, the harsh reality is that the global marketplace requires more exacting efficiency and product saturation than ever before. Even if Charlie was the best boy in the world, he still wouldn't be a match for global capitalism, a force that necessitates exploitation. And that's part of what makes Charlie's win so meaningless. He was one poor child in a world full of poor children. The only thing that made Charlie special was that he happened to get the golden ticket. He was lucky. And his individual luck isn't going to magically lift millions of other less lucky people out of poverty. It helped his family. It didn't actually solve the issue that made his family poor in the first place. In the Broadway musical, as the children are lining up at the factory gates preparing to go in and the newscasters are interviewing them, something interesting happens. Right after they've finished chatting with Charlie, the final interviewee, the news guy comments on how malnourished Charlie looks and starts to say, poverty is such a terrible thing, but then gets interrupted by Wonka's arrival. Wonka, coming onto the scene, stopped any discussion of poverty. And if that's not a metaphor for this entire thing, I don't know what is. <laughs> it's like these stories come so close to actually saying something real about systemic issues around income inequality and poverty and capitalism, but just didn't. The story lays bare a lot of these more shameful elements of our society. But while the creators don't use that as an opportunity to make any kind of larger statement, we can. This story shows us difficult truths about ourselves and our society. But the good news is that it's a fun story with wacky characters, so it makes looking at these difficult truths a little bit easier. Or, as Ron Novi puts it, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a fun story. But behind the story are assumptions about how the world is, or perhaps should be. These assumptions create, or rather reproduce, a world of white Western privilege in which a savage, diminutive race of people is exploited by a business owner for his own profit. But it's excusable because they seem to be happy. Although some may think critiquing Dull's classic on these grounds is taking the book too seriously for a piece of children's literature, our acceptance of this scenario, our inability to see it for what it is, speaks to the need to have this discussion. The invisibility of the racism and the colonial assumptions in this story speaks to how readily we accept the idea of Western white exceptionalism and are dismissive of the needs and the value of Native people. That's a problem. Our world, like Dahl's story, is built on assumptions, and some of these have real consequences like slave labor, child labor, and exploitation. These need to be laid bare and questioned, Perhaps doing so while thinking about Willy Wonka will make it a little bit easier. In other words, a spoonful of sugar really helps the anti-capitalism go down. Now, not everything is doom and gloom. There are some good things to be learned from these stories, and there are some parts of the adaptations that I genuinely really liked. Like, Charlie Bucket. In all of the adaptations, except for the Broadway musical. He is just a joy. He is a good kid played by a good actor and he really does capture that sense of childhood wonder. Like, 
He may be a bit boring at times, like in the 2005 film, Charlie is just a total blank slate. He has like two facial expressions total. He doesn't learn anything and he doesn't grow, but he is adorable and he is charming, so he is allowed to be boring. The Bucket family as a whole is also pretty great. While some of the grandparents can be kind of grumpy, they're like 90. They're allowed to be not super into everything all the time. <laughs> And one of the nice things about Charlie being the hero is that the story doesn't shy away from the value of elders and generational knowledge. I mean, Charlie's grandparents are a constant source of support and wisdom, and the closeness of their family is just super. I also really like the line from the 2005 film, candy doesn't have to have a point, that's why it's candy. I just, I think that it does a really great job of capturing the whimsy that was in the original book, and it almost takes away some of that, like, cultural power that the candy has in the film, which is just an interesting choice from the filmmakers. And it's impossible to talk about these movies and musicals without mentioning the music. I mean, these films and shows have great, catchy songs, and all of the artists did a phenomenal job, so shoutouts to Leslie Bercuse, Anthony Newley, Mark Shaman, Scott Whitman, and Danny Elfman. All three of those. Those last three have man at the end of their name. That's funny. <laughs> but no, like, I, while I was writing the script, I was listening to one of the songs from the Broadway musical on repeat. The song that I mentioned a couple times in the script is the one where Wonka comes onto the scene and he does like the fake out and then he's singing about how the factory has to be believed to be seen and it's this weird like inversion of the line and it's it sounds like a villain song. It je like go listen like on Spotify or YouTube or whatever, find the song, listen to it. It sounds like a villain song. It's a villain song. And it's wonderful, and I love it, and I listened to it literally for like hours and hours and hours and hours on end. And it is in my brain, it's a part of me now. <laughs> okay. Also, last but not least, the most important and best thing, the edible grass in the factory. It is a special kind of mint candy that Wonka invented, and it has a name, and it's called Swudge. Swudge! What a marvelous word! Swudge. I love it. Swudge. It's so good. It just, it's a very, it's a good word. And don't forget, Wonka's story isn't over. There is a movie coming out next year and two Netflix series. One of them is an adaptation of the book and the other one is an original story about the Oompa Loompas. And some creators would worry that those would make a video quickly outdated, but I think on the contrary, this video is going to be even more relevant once those come out. Because who knows what kind of Wonkas those stories are going to show us. We could get a whole new Willy Wonka. Or we could just get a new version of these old faces. In either case, more Wonka means more information. It means more portraits of him that we can tear up and paste together to form a new mosaic. So please, take what you have learned from this video, and when you go see the new movie or when you watch the Netflix shows, Think about what kind of Willy Wonka you're getting, and what that Willy Wonka says about the culture that created him. And then, of course, just enjoy the show. Thanks for sticking around till the end of the video. This one was a big one. Uh, it got way out of hand, actually. Like. This video was supposed to be on the shorter end, and it was supposed to just be this like light, fun little analysis of this bad fictional billionaire, but instead, this happened. I, I, do, I didn't mean for it to be this long, I really apologize, but I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you did, feel free to share it and like and subscribe and comment and ring the bell. I think that's all the things, do all the YouTube things. Uh, that being said, I am considering still doing some of the other videos on fictional billionaires, like the guy from Robots, uh, Mr. Big Weld, and the family from Meet the Robinsons. So let me know if you want me to do those. I mean, I promise they're not going to be huge. I couldn't handle it if they were this huge. I wanted them to be small and fun. So let me know if you want me to do that. Also, if you are watching this when it comes out, then I, well, first of all, thank you. And I also want to let you know that I'm going to be hosting a live stream this Sunday. That is two days from when this is posted, around 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I'm going to be eating super sour candy and reading silly Willy Wonka fan theories and answering your questions about this video. So be sure to stop on by if that sounds fun. And if you are watching this from the future, 
that stream VOD should be in my live streams playlist, which I will have linked in the description and probably on the end screen and maybe even a card here if I remember to put that in. Uh, but if you want to stay up to date with when I'm doing streams or if you just want to like see pictures of all the lizards and toads that I find in my yard and also frogs, we have frogs now. Um, you can go follow me on Twitter at Zoe underscore the bee. Uh, anyway. I think that's all the housekeeping, so I also want to give a huge thanks to my patrons and YouTube channel members whose names you can see scrolling probably over here beside me. Uh, as well as a thanks to Aranok and Mainly Mandy for helping me hone some of my ideas here. Go follow them, I will have their channels linked in the description. Two wonderful creators who make awesome content. Highly recommend it, I have their channels linked in the description. I also want to give an extra special thank you to a tasty snack, Adam, Andrew, Dylan, Jaded Flames, Justin Lowry, Robert Bradford, Science Punk Sellout, and Will Swanson. Thank you so very much. If you would like to join these wonderful people, then you can join over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Zoe underscore B, or you can become a channel member by clicking the little join button that is down there beside the subscribe button, and you can get lots of cool stuff like early access to videos and having an end of video poem written just for you. Speaking of, <laughs> we're almost done, it's been a long day. Speaking of, it is time for our patron poem of the video. For Concilium, here is No Returns. I root for the vines that clamber and claw across the corpses of capitalism. The memories of wealth and specters of industry once standing proud at intersections and turnpikes. Now return to the earth and repent. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. Okay. Once a year, the Bunkit, Bunkit, the Bunkit family, and that's to say nothing of the commodification of the wonky, wonky, the wonky stir. Film adaptations and musicals and video game, video games. Not only are entire scenes dedicated to the children's mistakes, the children's mistakes. Woo. It's funny because it's bad. <laughs> we live in the bad timeline. That this is.